Are there more people outside? There yeah. are a couple of other dragging in chairs. Oh, Matt, you can grab a chair and drag it inside. Yeah, so I was um, chatting with uh, Marty Fair this morning about the fact that we both have PhD students doing thesis defenses today. And Marty said it's best if it's really best to start out with a really embarrassing story about some major screw up um, to start off the defense appropriately. Um, and but really, I you know the most embarrassing thing about Julie is that she's never really had any really embarrassing major screw ups as far as I know. <laughs> she's kind of one of those all around Renaissance women. She can. She's a great cook, she can dance, she can play soccer, <laughs> she can keep things organized. You'll hear a little bit about her, you won't hear too much about her system engineering today, I think it'll be in the background of the physics. Um, but uh, I remember when I was a graduate student, I was once working with a postdoc, um, and we had a doer that had, a, we had a, a Christat that had a leak, so we were pulling it out and we had a large uh, increase in the pressure in the Christat, and, um, and the probe um, exploded out of the door and crashed through the ceiling, moving the ceiling panels out of the way and then fell back down again and completely smashed our sample. And it was really awful and we were totally demoralized and we took a lot of time off and everything had completely stopped. Um, but in our lab, when um, there was a doer that got overpressure um, for reasons that I won't explain here, that's a story for somebody else's thesis defense. <laughs> 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 um, but when the cryostat went, went fly, when the probe went flying out of the door, in this case, it happened just as Julie entered the lab and she ran across the room and caught the frozen probe with her bare hands, um, saving the experiment. So that's the best I can come to an embarrassing failure. Um, so, Julie. Thank you very much, Cam. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, superconductivity interfaces, specifically talking about uh, ways of measuring and probing the complex oxides. So the complex oxides are actually a really interesting uh, group of materials, and they've formed the fundamentals of a lot of technologies, from the cell phones in your pocket, the uh, high-K dielectrics that are enabling them to get to smaller and smaller dimensions, to superconducting magnets that drive MRIs. These are all complex oxide materials. Uh, but as we look forward and want to think about developing uh, new technologies in the future, it's really important to understand the physics that goes on to drive these interesting functionalities. And it's really talking about how to measure this physics and um, probe it that is going to be the focus of this talk. So as an outline, I'm going to talk about new behavior at interfaces in the complex oxides and why we're interested in these layered structures rather than just bulk materials. Uh, I'll go on to talk about the benefits of using a local probe, specifically um, we're, we're using a scanning squid microscope for this. And then uh, the two results I'm going to share today are some of our unexpected uh, behavior at the LAOSTO interface and our discovery specifically of coexistence of superconductivity and magnetism at that interface. And then I'm going to conclude with talking about what we can learn from gate tuning this interface. So first, I'm going to return to the complex oxide materials and give you a little bit of a primer on them. The complex oxides are a crystalline arrangement of oxygen and metal ions. One of the most common crystal structures is the perovskite structure, which has this ABO3 formalism. So formula, so A and B are going to be your metallic ions, and the oxygen is going to form the lattice in between. And what's really nice about this particular structure is that just by changing what your A and B ions are, you can get a very diverse array of properties in these materials. So everything from ferroelectrics, ferromagnetics, superconductivity, piezoelectrics, and so on and so forth. And this is because of the interplay when you have the different metallic ions. They have different spin, charge, slightly different sizes of lattice and different orbitals. And the way these things come together at the, at, and make the crystal structure controls these different properties. So these materials um, have been well understood and well studied for a long time, and they have many engineering applications, some of which may be familiar to you. 
Uh, so all of these compounds have this uh, perovskite ABO3 structure, and so they range from piezoelectrics, which actually we use for um, our scanning devices, and so you can use them as sensing and actuating devices. Uh, ferroelectrics is another form of these that are, this is where you'll have an electric field that gets set up in a material and they're often used for um, waveguides and other types of optical components. Uh, thermoelectrics, these are materials where the temperature is correlated with the resistance and so you can use it as a current limiter for example, whereas you're putting more and more current into the device, you're raising the temperature and then that in turn will choke off the resistance. Alternatively, temperature sensors have been used. And then, of course, the high-K dielectrics that I mentioned, which enable um, transistors to become smaller and sm on a smaller and smaller length scale. But this is all pretty much established technology. So what does the future hold in these materials? Specifically, um, what we're looking at is complex oxides as a canvas for new compounds. So ma mainly using one type of oxide material as a substrate for growing a second one. And the lattice matching of this perovskite lattice really allows for effective growth of these thin films. So what you're actually seeing here, these are individual metallic ions in a complex oxide lattice. And this is uh, strontium titanium in the bottom and lanthanum aluminate on the top. And you can see uh, the lattice looks very perfect as you go from one to the other. Now, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate have slightly different lattice constants. So this, uh, this exact arrangement won't last forever as you grow infinite numbers of lanthanum aluminate, but if you keep the layers thin, you can get these very nice thin film structures. And what's even more exciting is that when you start to layer these materials, you find that these interfaces have very different properties than either of the bulk materials. So as you change, as you put in strain or you change the charge differential between these two layers, you get new uh, phenomenology that's happening at these interfaces. So, What's one example of this new uh, phenomenology? Specifically, um, if again I take the LAOSTO, these are both, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate are both insulators. But if you grow at least four unit cells of lanthanum aluminate on strontium titanate, you find that you go from zero conductivity, as you would expect for an insulator, and then all of a sudden you have electrons at the interface at more than four unit cells. So now you have a conductor in between two insulators at an interface. And this is really surprising behavior. So not only do you have a conductor um, below 200 millikelvin in this example, it goes superconducting. That's what uh, this abrupt drop in the resistance means. And also it's gate tunable. So what you're seeing here, the different colors show different gate voltages. And just like with a transistor, where you can tune a voltage and you can change the number of carriers in a channel, you can actually change the resistance here, which this is resistance, as a function of gate voltage. And it also changes the critical temperature for superconductivity, which is the point at which these curves are diving down sharply uh, and resistance is going to zero. So this is an example of where an interface is enabling behavior that isn't possible in the bulk of either materials. So now the question is, how can we actually probe these interfaces? What are the techniques people use to measure what's going on? And specifically, the most common techniques are electron, electric transport and magnetization. So in transport measurements, you attach four contacts to your sample. You'll source a current and measure a voltage. And in this configuration, I've shown a Hall effect uh, measurement. If you wanted to just measure the longitudinal resistance, for example, you would take the voltage across the same two contacts as your current. A second way to, do, to measure the properties of these interfaces is magnetization. In this case, you apply a large magnetic field to the sample, and now you're looking for the smaller response, how the sample responds to that applied field. So there are a lot of benefits to these techniques. They're quick and relatively simple. And they're one of the main ways that crystal growers will actually check that their growth conditions are correct. Um, also, if you're careful with your analysis, you can actually back out a lot of the physics that's going on in these uh, materials using these transport and magnetization techniques. And finally, if you, you ever want to build devices for these materials, in the end, we're looking towards functionality for new devices, um, it's really this bulk functionality that's going to be the most important thing that's going to drive your device physics. However, these techniques also have some drawbacks. They have relatively low sensitivity. So if you have 
behaviors that are going on at the interface that have a very small signal, they're going to be hidden in these, um, in these bulk measurement techniques. Also, if you have very... the transport hat was highly sensitive. It is highly sensitive, but you can... It, it definitely is highly sensitive. Um, but you can definitely miss, so for example, the, mag, uh, the ferromagnetic domains that we're pointing out, um, in order to actually see what their structure is, you don't have the sensitivity where you're averaging over a large uh, area. Yeah, so, I would say that's the second thing. Right, and so, so magnetization is not sensitive yeah. enough, right, to, see the, the, to, to measure the magnetization of, say, the little ferromagnetic domains in our system. And then the transport is going to hide some kind of small scale variation. So these are problems with both of these techniques. Um, also, a specifically, a problem again with magnetization is artifacts and background. You're putting this whole bulk sample into a magnetic field. And really, all we're interested in is what's happening at the interface. So if either of the bulk materials are providing some kind of signal, then it's very hard to separate that out. And that, this, that you can also get artifacts and transport if your um, patterning isn't aligned exactly correct. You can get longitudinal resistance in your uh, Hall resistance and vice versa. Um, and finally, in a superconductor, the resistance drops to zero. So if you really want to study the temperature dependence of the superfluid density, for example, you can't do that via resistance. So uh, transport is very sensitive right near TC, but anywhere below TC, you don't really have much information about the state. So the challenge that I'm proposing is how can we locally monitor the changes we're creating with engineering at this atomic level? And so the approach used by our group is to use scanning squid microscopy. Uh, what scanning squid microscopy allows you to do is make local and spatially resolved magnetic measurements. And so in this case, um, the specific magnetic measurements we're making is measurements of diamagnetism, paramagnetism, or just flux. And these map directly onto the physics that you might find in a sample. Specifically, superconductivity is going to manifest itself as a diamagnetic signal for us. Um, if we have any kind of localized spins, they're going to be a paramagnetic signal, and any kind of underlying ferromagnetic order is going to be some kind of static flux si signal. So then, what is a squid? A squid is a superconducting quantum interference device. At its most simple, it's just a loop of superconductor with two weak links in it. And in this case, the flux that passes through the loop is proportional to the voltage across it. So it's a flux voltage transducer, and you can engineer squids to be the world's most sensitive magnetic flux detectors. Now we've taken our squid design a couple steps further. So we've taken this circle and actually twisted it into a figure eight. And you can actually see that in this dark outline here. And what that arrangement does, that's called a gradiometer rather than a magnetometer. And so it means that if there's any kind of background field that's passing through the squid in its entirety, the flux in each of these two loops should be opposite, and therefore the net effect should be zero. In addition, we've also shielded the squid with the superconducting shields to make sure that if our gradiometric design is not quite perfect, that we still shield out any kind of stray flux that might create a background signal for us. These green coils here are modulation coils, which we use to, keep the, which we use to uh, run the squid in feedback mode. So we actually maintain the squid at the same point on its phi i curve and measure only the feedback signal, so measure changes away from that. And it keeps it at its most sensitive position. Uh, finally, these cyan lines here represent a field coil. And if we put a current in through these lines, we can generate a local field and see how the sample responds to that field. So we can not only measure static flux or magnetometry, we can also measure susceptibility. And so if we actually want to make a measurement here, we basically want to have the sample affecting one of these two symmetric loops. Because again, since it's a gradiometric design, we need to have a differential here. So the way we actually do that, well, after, hold on. So also, one last point is that most of the units you're going to see in this talk are going to be in units of phi naught of the superconducting flux quantum. That's because this sensor actually measures flux, and so we convert all of our voltage measurements back into flux, which is the physical quantity that we're measuring. So this is what the squid actually looks like. It's, um, it's a niobium evaporated on silicon process that's with 11 layers of fabrication to get all the shields and all the vias and everything else 
from shorting. We make these um, in collaboration with Martin Huber at UC Denver. And uh, this actually is a zoom in of the pickup loop. Um, this is on the side of the squid that we would bring in close contact with the sample. So this is the side that's actually going to be measuring the sample. Whereas this one is going to be the balanced one. It looks identical to this, but it's going to be far away. And so you get this differential that I was just mentioning. In order to do that, we take the silicon and polish it away till we get a corner. So the loop sits in the very corner of that, uh, of that squid, or sorry, the loop sits in the very corner of the chip so it can be brought very close contact to within about a micron of the sample. <clears throat> so the squid itself is mounted on a scanner. So the scanner is shown here. There is a S-bender stage for moving an X and Y. S-benders are effective because they allow us to move in X and Y without moving in Z because this, the uh, benders curve in, in an S shape. These benders provide us with a fine micron scan, a fine scan range of about 300 microns. The squid itself is mounted on a cantilever piezo here that can bring it into and out of contact with the sample. And then the whole scanning apparatus is set on a stack of these piezoelectric stick slip cubes and they provide us with five millimeters of total movement. So we can take a 300 micron scan range, but we can take that at multiple places across a sample. So we can really explore a large area of any sample. So these are the two ways that the squid makes a measurement. So again, with the pickup loop here, the flux that passes through the loop is going to be um, proportional to the magnetic field. And so if we actually move the loop back and forth across the sample, we can make a map of the flux that's going through it. And so this is a measurement, again, in phi naught. In susceptometry mode, what we're doing is we're now we drive a current through the field coil. And if we make this an AC current, we can actually use a lock-in technique to only measure so that this pickup loop here is just sensitive to responses at the same frequency. And so now we can look at how the sample is actually responding to an applied field or a susceptibility. And so in the case of a superconductor, which is going to have mobile electrons that can screen an applied field, what we're actually then mapping are the screening currents from the material. And so this is a superconducting sample, and you can see variations in the amount that the superconductor is able to screen the field, which is proportional to the susceptibility. The units for susceptibility are going to be in fine knots per amp because the signal that, respond, that uh, is responding is always going to be uh, proportional to the driving current. So we've normalized all of these by the, uh, by the current. So in the future, well, the color scales for magnetometry are always going to be this red, green, blue, or this red, yellow, green. And for um, susceptibility are going to be uh, blue, tan, and uh, red. But you can also look at the units to know uh, which mode we're working in. And then the last benefit of this is that because this is a DC measurement and this is an AC measurement, we can actually take these two images at the exact same time. So just by doing a low pass filter on the signal, we map out the, the DC flux in the sample. And by looking at the lock-in uh, signal, we can map out the screening currents. And so this is for the measurements that you'll see in the future where I talk about measuring coexistence of magnetism superconductivity, this really is a true coexistent measurement where both measurements are being taken at the same time. <coughs> so uh, that concludes the measurement capabilities of the system. Uh, we've ha we've uh, our lab has really worked on pushing this gradiometric shielded squid design, which has been optimized for our scanning purposes. We have a spatial resolution of about three microns, which is just set by the size of the pickup loop, which is going to be brought close to the sample. Uh, the magnetic sensitivity is quite good. I hadn't mentioned this yet, but um, our noise floor uh, is about a quarter of a microfi knot per root hertz. This corresponds to about 200 Bohr magnetons, or three times 10 to the minus 11 Tesla. And to give you guys a feeling, if you have a commercial MPMS, this is about eight times more sensitive than, or eight orders of magnitude, sorry, more sensitive than a commercial, <laughs> sorry, orders of magnitude, uh, than a commercial MPMS bulk squid design. What's an MPMS? Uh, magnetic probe, I'm not actually sure what it is, magnetic um, properties, properties. Uh, measurement system. 
It's, um, a standard it's a standard magnetization probe from quantum design. It's a commercial one. So where a lot of the bulk magnetization measurements that I was referencing in the beginning uh -huh. are all done in an, mostly done in MPM 